The Franco-Prussian War in 1870 changed the course of European history. It was fought between France on one side against Prussia and its German allies on the other. The results of this conflict would lead to the newly created German Empire, while for France on the other hand, it would lead to the end of their second empire and the end of France being the leading power on the European continent, with the newly created Germany now taking up that spot. For this video, I will not be going into the actual details of this conflict, like who won what battle, but rather I'm going to focus on how these two countries ended up at war. And I'm not just going to look at the events of 1870, or the events directly surrounding 1870 that led to war. In order to get proper context, I'm going to go into a deep dive about how these two nations had developed over the course of the 1800s, and how that development led them on a collision course to discover who would be the dominant power in Europe, France or a German state. Let's dive right into it. To understand how France and Prussia entered into war in 1870, we first must go into how these two nations had evolved over the last half century or so. On the French side, in 1870, they were run by Napoleon III. That's the nephew of the famous Napoleon Bonaparte. So how did another Napoleon rise to power? Well, let's start with after the original Napoleon was defeated for the final time in 1815. That led to the Bourbon monarchy to be restored as a constitutional monarchy running France. Obviously, this restoration was not by popular will from the French population. It was a demand by the other great powers after having defeated Napoleon. Over the next 30 years, the monarchy would grow increasingly unpopular, leading to revolts. One of those key revolts was in 1830, actually, when Charles X was replaced in a rebellion when he tried to turn the constitutional monarchy into an absolute monarchy, which would have given him total control of France. He was overthrown and replaced by Louis Philippe. Louis Philippe never tried to become an absolute monarch, though. But by 1848, the living standards had continued to decline, and the people of France had had enough of monarchy rule. That's when another revolt broke out, to end monarchical rule once and for all. 1848 is an iconic year in history, though. It's the year in which many of the great powers of Europe experienced revolts. And this is where Napoleon III comes into play. Louis Napoleon, which is Napoleon III's full name, had unsuccessfully tried several times before 1848 to reclaim the throne for his family, only to be exiled and imprisoned. By 1848, the atmosphere in France had changed to create the perfect conditions for Louis' return. After several decades of misrule at the hands of monarchs, the French people had a longing for the glory days of the Napoleonic years, back when France was the great power on the European continent. This was the perfect atmosphere for a Bonaparte to return. Louis Napoleon came back for the throne and tapped into that French longing, promising the people that he would lead France back to prominence. The revolts that paved the way for Louis Napoleon to return had actually turned France into a republic, its second republic. And in December of 1848, Napoleon would be named the republic's president. A problem rose for Napoleon though. As part of the second republic's constitution, it was forbidden to re-elect the president after the expiration of his four-year term. And when Louis Napoleon realized that he could not obtain the three-fourths majority necessary for a revision to that constitution, he carried out a coup on December 2nd, 1851. And just like that was the end of the Second Republic of France. And now France was an empire once again, and ruled by Napoleon III as emperor. As an emperor, Napoleon wasn't hated by the people at first. He invested in public works projects, like the construction of railroads, which helped to soak up unemployed and generate revenue for the state. As well, he oversaw the renovation of Paris with new boulevards and parks. Napoleon was especially popular in the rural regions of France, where he invested heavily in French agriculture. That rural population in France was how Napoleon maintained his power. 70% of the population of France at this time were peasants who lived on farms. And so anytime Napoleon needed to solidify his regime, he would use his constitutional power, which gave him the ability to put questions directly to the French people. 
and then have them vote on it, and from there he can assert a mandate. Those rural peasants would vote in a landslide for whatever Napoleon's preferred policy was. The peasants recognized that the grants their villages received often flowed in direct proportion to the enthusiasm they registered during Napoleon's votes. The urban liberal French really hated this system that they called ruralocracy. Domestic policy was not the hallmark of Napoleon's regime though. After all, he wanted to recreate the power and prestige of his uncle's reign. And that's why foreign policy is where we really see Napoleon embrace an active role. Two conflicts in particular helped France to reclaim its status as the dominant military power on the European continent. First is the Crimean War from 1854 to 1856. And then the next is the Second Italian War of Independence in 1859. In the Crimean War, France and Great Britain combined to defeat Russia. And then in that Second Italian War of Independence, France sided with Piedmont and Sardinia to defeat Austria, which then led to a united Italian state. And just like that, France had been part of victories against the two other major land powers in Europe, Russia and Austria. These victories had restored national dignity. However, with the end of the 1850s and the start of the 1860s is when we see those foreign policy successes start to make way for foreign policy failures. In 1861, Napoleon III invaded Mexico under the guise of collecting unpaid debts. They were joined by Spain and Great Britain for this intervention, but then Napoleon used this opportunity to solidify his reach in North America by installing Archduke Maximilian of Austria as Emperor of Mexico. Napoleon's goal here was to have Mexico become a client state of France, so basically a puppet government that Napoleon could dictate to. This failed miserably though. And ultimately in 1867, the French had to withdraw the remaining forces as the war had just become too costly. Shortly after the French troops left, Maximilian was executed. This adventure had cost France over $1 billion and really angered the United States. Another setback was in 1863 when Napoleon failed in his attempt to recreate an independent Poland, which deeply angered the Russians. Napoleon was gifted at angering other states. The greatest foreign policy issue though was closer to home. That was the rise of a powerful German state on their border. Napoleon Bonaparte, the famous one, had actually contributed to this rise. In 1806, he dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, creating a puppet state called the Confederation of the Rhine. The German people of these lands didn't exactly enjoy being under Napoleon's rule, since he used their resources and people to facilitate his continual wars. That resentment started to unite the people in their Germanness. Up until this point, German simply referred to the language, not any kind of state or people. The people of those German lands may have spoken the same language, but they were deeply divided when it came to culture, religion, economics, and politics. So anyway, after Napoleon is defeated once and for all in 1815, the victorious powers have to figure out what to do with the German states. In the Congress of Vienna, they create the German Confederation, which, to be honest, was basically the same thing as the Confederation of the Rhineland, except now Austria would be in charge. The Emperor of Austria was named to be President of the German Confederation lands. This German Confederation was a weak and loose alliance. And over the decades after 1815, the calls grew stronger for the German-speaking people of these lands to unite in order to protect themselves from being taken advantage of by great powers like Russia, France, and Austria, and also to help unite and enhance German interests. So this is where Prussia comes into play. They were the largest German state of the region and could be in charge after said unification. Or at least that's what the Prussians thought. One Prussian leader in particular was fond of this idea, and that was Otto von Bismarck. He looked to unify the North German states, remove Austria from that German confederation, and strengthen the position of the Prussian king. War would be the main way Prussia would achieve this unification. The first war was with Denmark in 1864, over the Danes annexing Schleswig-Holstein. I'm sorry if that pronunciation wasn't good enough. Holsten was in the German Confederation actually, and so Prussia and Austria declared war on Denmark and quickly defeated them. Because of that war, Prussia gained Schleswig, 
and Austria received Holstein. This would then lead to the Austro-Prussian War of 1866. Tensions started between those two nations because Austria didn't like how much economic influence Prussia had on Holstein and the rest of the German Confederation states. Then it exploded into open hostilities when Prussian troops occupied Holstein. Prussian forces led by General Moltke then went on to emphatically defeat Austria and its northern allies in a war that barely lasted a month. The crowning victory of that war was the decisive Battle of Koniggratz, where the Prussian forces massacred their Austrian opposition. In the armistice to end the Austro-Prussian War, Austria agreed to surrender its authority over the German states. Austria had strong control in the German states since the 1500s, at first during the Holy Roman Empire and then through the already mentioned German Confederation. So this was a major moment. Neither Austria nor France was now dominant in German affairs. A German state was. Prussia had a free hand to do as it pleased in the German lands. Bismarck quickly reshuffled Germany. He abolished the 39-state German Confederation and annexed most of the northern members. He then packed the rest of the northern German states into a northern German Confederation, with Berlin in control of its foreign and military affairs, which essentially made them Prussian territory. There were still a couple of independent German states left, though. The main three were Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden. Those three were next on Bismarck's mind. He wanted to incorporate them into a broader, fully unified German state. However, France and Napoleon III were well aware and concerned at this possibility. Those three states would be the key to any Prussian invasion of France, since it gave the Prussians the ability to invade France on a broad front. Napoleon and the French leadership became determined to avoid any connection between Prussia and those three states. The results of the Austro-Prussian War had been a major surprise for Napoleon. He never expected such a decisive, quick victory, and was actually hoping that those two would fight to a draw, weakening both of them. That is why before the war, he sided with Prussia, because he saw Austria as the more powerful of the two, so it served his interest for it to be weakened. Because of that surprise, the French didn't have any forces available to intervene and prevent the enlargement of Prussia. France had troops scattered all over the globe during that pivotal time in 1866. They had 63,000 in Algeria, another 28,000 in Mexico, 8,000 in Rome, and 2,000 in Indochina. That left barely 100,000 troops available to use against Prussia. For comparison, Prussia's army in 1866 was three times that number. And so Napoleon was left to sit and watch as Prussia became a major power on his doorstep. The transformation of Prussia from minor power with an efficient military to major power who could influence global politics cannot be understated. In 1860, Prussia had just half the population of France. But after Prussia's victory over Austria, that population number shifted dramatically closer. Prussia now had 30 million people, compared to France's 38 million people. However, in military terms, Prussia was larger. They had universal conscription, which simply meant that every able-bodied man was required to join the military for a period of time, which made their army one-third larger than France's. As well, because of universal conscription, Prussia would have a vast well of trained reserves for their army, that they could tap into in the event of a war, and especially a war with France. France, on the other hand, did not have universal conscription, although they would introduce it after the Franco-Prussian War. That wasn't all. With the new territory, Prussian coal mines were now outproducing France, and German railway production was equal to that of France. Just two years ago, France was the dominant power on the European continent, and now it was quickly being overshadowed by the Germans. Furthermore, if Prussia was able to combine with those three German states of Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden, that would add an additional 200,000 well-trained troops and 8 million people to their state. To the French, this is just simply unacceptable. 
it is especially infuriating for them because they had long been in control of German affairs. Like I said, Napoleon Bonaparte had taxed and looted the German lands for roughly 250,000 troops to help fight his wars. They are not used to little brother suddenly being so powerful. Louis Napoleon did try to balance the scales tipping against France and to humble Prussia by demanding territorial compensation after the Austro-Prussian War. Specifically, he was looking at Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Rhineland. If Napoleon's France got these lands, he claimed he would accept Prussia's new territorial gains in Germany. However, these territorial demands by Napoleon went nowhere. The British would never accept an idea involving France getting any piece of Belgium, and so Napoleon has angered another country. As well, by demanding Luxembourg and the Rhineland, Bismarck was able to expertly play up the notion of an aggressive France trying to invade German lands. Bismarck felt the only way that he could truly unite the people of the different German-speaking lands was in defense against a foreign power. And it would especially help if it was a foreign power who had a history of exploiting German lands and people, i.e. the French. And so his goal became to continually egg on Napoleon in order to get the French to act aggressively towards the Germans. Not all the German states were too keen to join a unified nation, though. In the years that separated the Austro-Prussian War and the Franco-Prussian War, the three German states of Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden had actually enjoyed their independence, and they liked the idea of being separate from the Northern German Confederation. Sure, they were happy to trade with them, but they liked the flexibility of choosing whether or not to join on Prussia's side in the event of a war. In fact, their alliance with the northern German states in Prussia only required those three states to join in a war on the Prussian side in defense of Germany. Defense is a very key word in there. And that was all the more reason that Bismarck had to get France to be aggressive. Napoleon and his regime were perfectly vulnerable to play the role of aggressor. Like I said, the 1860s were not kind to Napoleon and his regime. But it wasn't just international issues that caused him problems. Domestic fissures continued to grow. Under his regime, all the power rested in Napoleon's hands. Obviously, he was an emperor after all. But here's a good example to showcase just how powerful his control was. As emperor, he was the only one with the authority to propose legislation. From there, the legislative branch could only vote yes or no on the emperor's proposal. They couldn't amend or recommend their own legislature. Napoleon also had the power to appoint the mayors of the different precincts or districts. That's a lot of power for one man. And over time, people start to grow tired of this one-man government, especially as Napoleon's health starts to decline in the 1860s. That decline adds fuel to the fire for the voices who want a more Republican-style government. All that power and control of French society can't be put into one man's declining hands. Napoleon's regime's legitimacy hurt even more because he surrounded himself with yes-men ministers and embezzled huge portions of money from the government to his family members. A good example of this corruption level was that the emperor kept a constant $1 million deposit in London at Baring Brothers. This was there just in case Napoleon's regime collapsed and he had to flee. Corruption and anger at Napoleon's authoritarian rule eventually led to more and more riots to break out. Napoleon responded to civil unrest by trying to solidify his reign the way he always did, which was by basically holding a sham election. During these elections, Napoleon and his ministers would ensure pro-emperor candidates would win seats in the legislature, which would make it appear as though the French people had voted in support of his rule. However, in the late 1860s, this vote backfired and Republicans shockingly increased their seats in the legislative body to 74 of the 292 seats. Which is pretty wild since Napoleon controlled all the leaders of the different districts. That's why even though it may seem like a small gain to only have 74 seats, but that group could become very active critics of Napoleon's government from within, rather than just being voices shouting from outside the government. They would be able to generate plenty of headlines from attacking Napoleon's proposals. Napoleon, more than anything, needs a uniting victory. And there's only one thing all parties in France agreed upon at this time, 
and that was war with Prussia, in order to reassert French dominance on the continent and to humble Prussia. As well, a war is great for Napoleon because he can use the excuse of national unity and an emergency to crush his growing Republican opposition. To further Napoleon's goal of a more active and aggressive approach towards Bismarck and Prussia, in May of 1870, he changed foreign ministers. Daru was a dove. He was committed to disarmament. And so Napoleon replaced Daru with Grammont. Grammont was just the war hawk Napoleon needed. Grammont vowed to manufacture a war under almost any pretext to humble Berlin. Grammont wasn't the best diplomat though. During the eventual crisis that led to war, he took for granted alliances that he never actually bothered to officially solidify. Three countries in particular, Grammont and Napoleon were relying on. And not just relying on for support, but active participation in the war with Prussia. Those three were Austria-Hungary, Italy, and Denmark. Grammont assumed that Austria-Hungary, which became a dual monarchy after their loss in the Austro-Prussian War, would join France in a revenge war against Prussia. He also assumed Denmark would be motivated by their loss in 1864 to Prussia to join France's side. Finally, Italy, he assumed, would join France to show their gratitude for France's military support against Austria in 1859 during their unification war. If deals and alliances had been officially concluded between these three nations, it would have been a solid foundation of a coalition against Prussia. But Grammont never actually nailed down these deals officially to create real alliances. That meant France would enter a war under the assumption that it would not be fighting alone. However, none of those three countries would come to France's aid in this war. And as well, like I said, Napoleon's foreign policy had pissed off every other major nation, like Russia, the United States, and Great Britain, as I already mentioned. Ultimately, three crises in 1870 drove France to declare war on Prussia, which subsequently meant all the German states, since Prussia controlled the Northern German Confederation, and because France declared war first, that triggered the three Southern German states to go on the side of Prussia. The first one was when Bismarck pushed for King Wilhelm I to accept the title of German Kaiser or Emperor, which then led to Wilhelm making an appeal to a common German fatherland. Bismarck knew this speech would inflame Napoleon, as it inferred the southern German states should combine with the northern ones to create one Germany under Wilhelm. The next crisis was when Bismarck financed a railroad through Switzerland. This would connect Prussia and Italy. A Prussian-Italian alliance would be a direct threat to France's borders at two different points. And so naturally, Napoleon took issue with that. The final straw that led to war was due to a succession crisis. Spain needed a new royal ruling house after they deposed the Bourbons in 1868. So a Spanish agent reached out to Prince Leopold. Leopold was the Prussian king's nephew. From the Spanish perspective, Leopold was the perfect compromise candidate. Other than being the Prussian king's nephew, he was also a Roman Catholic, which the Spanish agents thought would make France happy. As well, Leopold was married to a member of the Portuguese royal family. That meant Leopold had connections with three other nations near Spain. However, in response to Spain, neither Leopold nor King Wilhelm of Prussia expressed much interest in this plan. Bismarck, though, saw this as the perfect situation to anger France and Napoleon. He implored Leopold's father to have his son accept the throne. And it worked. Leopold then accepted the Spanish offer, which naturally made Napoleon furious. This would mean that France was surrounded by the united powers of Spain and Prussia on France's western and its eastern borders. The French demanded that Leopold renounce the Spanish throne. And that actually worked because Leopold's father withdrew his son's candidacy in July of 1870. That wasn't the end of the crisis though. The French foreign minister, Grimont, wanted to add an extra layer of humbling to Prussia. He demanded that King Wilhelm sign and publish a document pledging that Prussia would never again offer any candidates to the Spanish throne. This was something meant to humble the Prussian king, since such a demand could not be realistically accepted. 
When the French ambassador to Prussia told Wilhelm this, Wilhelm responded by telling his entourage to cancel his meeting with the French ambassador, Benedetti. Bismarck then seized the moment to get his unifying war. He took the king's message for the French ambassador and changed it. Originally, the message stated that Wilhelm was putting off the meeting with Benedetti because confirmation had been received of Prince Leopold's withdrawal. Bismarck changed it to have the king rudely canceling the meeting without any explanation. Because the French were seeking satisfaction in this dispute, the rude message made by Bismarck would be interpreted as casus belli, or justifying war. France immediately took the bait and declared war on July 19th, 1870. And because France was the one who declared war, and declared war for what many saw as a minor insult, not really worthy of a war, world opinion, but more importantly, opinion in those three southern German states saw France firmly as the aggressor. That led to the states of Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden to enthusiastically join Prussia and their northern German confederation in defense of the German people by going to war against France. If the Franco-Prussian War seems like a low justification for war, I mean, after all, it was basically declared because of an insult, well, welcome to Europe in the 1800s. To truly grasp the reason why this war started, you have to understand that insult was just the final straw that started the war. France and Prussia were on a collision course once German nationalism took root. Because of that feeling among the people of those German lands to form a united nation, it propelled Prussia and ultimately Germany to rising power status. Being a rising power on the European continent caused natural friction with the established power, France. France was used to being the dominant land power on the European continent and wasn't willing to just step aside and watch Germany overtake them. While Prussia, on the other hand, saw their ascent and the formation of a German nation as natural and just progress. Combine that dynamic with the fact that these two powers share a border, and you have an explosive combination. It's natural that they would have friction. And in the 1800s, the only way that friction could be resolved is by the two fighting it out to determine who would be the leader of the continent going forward. Another underrated reason why these two countries found themselves in conflict is that they both valued war to solidify their states. The regime of Napoleon III was built on bringing France back to the glory days of Napoleon Bonaparte, and that meant military conquest. And the thing about a regime built on conquest is that it's naturally unsustainable. Wars are costly and expensive, and it will keep putting a nation into fights until eventually that nation just exhausts itself. France was at the point of exhaustion in 1870, especially militarily. Prussia was similar in that respect. The German state was formed because of war. Wars against Denmark, Austria, and then France. Even though they won all three of those wars, that drive to keep conquering would eventually lead Germany into a conflict with the premier world power of Great Britain in a world war this time. And that conflict would ultimately end the German Empire. In the actual fighting of the Franco-Prussian War though, Prussia and its German allies would dominate the war. They actually captured the French Emperor Napoleon III at Sedan in September of 1870, and then finally got the French leaders to submit to Prussian surrender terms in January of 1871. The terms were harsh for France. They had to pay a large war indemnity and lost good portions of territory like in Alsace and Lorraine. As well, in an extra humiliation, Prussian troops were allowed to march through Paris to really drive home that France was no longer the dominant power on the European continent. That position belonged to the newly created German state. The Franco-Prussian War and the ensuing peace treaty would leave simmering tensions, which would help create the conditions that sparked World War I. Now, I'm not saying the Franco-Prussian War caused World War I. There's a lot of other reasons that war broke out. More so, the Franco-Prussian War is just one chapter in the story of the Great War. But what the Franco-Prussian War did do was drastically 
revised the great power pecking order on the European continent, which makes it an incredibly important conflict. And that's what makes it vital to learn how and why this conflict broke out. And I truly hope you learned some good context as to why the war sparked. I appreciate you watching. I'm sorry if I pronounced anything wrong.